Hi, I'm Casey, pastor of Quest Church, a community of grace. Thanks for making time to watch or listen to this message. If it helps you in some way, let me encourage you to do two things. First, share it with somebody else. Second, if you don't already, consider becoming a financial partner with Quest. We are 100% supported with gifts by people like you. And now, here's today's message. Today's reading is from Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Good morning again. Before we uh, go into exploring scripture together, let's pause and pray. Father, thank you for this word spoken to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit, who uh, moved writers long ago to record these words for us, would bring these words to life again today and use them to give life to us. We pray that we would be good soil and that as you speak to us, your word, your message spoken into our hearts would take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to be in Luke 8 today, and we're reading the Gospel of Luke to answer this question. What does it look like to follow the way of Jesus? The first Christians were not called Christians. They were called people on the way, the way of life given by and modeled by Jesus. And today we read a famous story told by Jesus, the parable of the sower. And in this short story, Jesus talks about our listening skills, but more than that, he's also talking uh, about why do some people receive the gospel and some don't? And this is a question that gets asked every generation. It gets asked by every parent who follows Jesus. You know, I want my kid to, to embrace Jesus like I do, will they? Um, I want my friend, my coworker, my neighbor to embrace Jesus, to see what I see, to have the faith that I have. Entire people groups have heard the gospel. Some people have responded and said, yes, I want Jesus. Others have said no. Most famously of all, Jesus came to the Jewish people. And within a generation or two, very 
few of the Jewish people had responded positively to Jesus as the Messiah. And most surprising of all, thousands and eventually millions of non-Jewish people said yes to this Jewish Messiah. Why do some people say yes to Jesus and the gospel and others don't? Well, Jesus tells this story in part to answer that question. But he's also talking about how we listen, how we hear, and what is it that we really listen with. Well, let's take a closer look as we look here at the story in Luke chapter 8. So Jesus is back on the road, and he is going town to town throughout Galilee. And we've got a map, again, for you to kind of orient yourself where we are. Um, off to the upper left there is uh, that little blob of blue. That's the Mediterranean Sea, the little blob of blue right there, kind of in the, the middle right. That's the sea or lake of Galilee. And uh, then you can see the, the word Galilee kind of strewn across there in the middle. Um, and that's the region that he's in. And maybe you recognize some of those names, Nazareth uh, or Capernaum. If we kept going further down or south, eventually we would get to Jerusalem. And of course, that's where the story is headed to uh, as we continue reading. But as he's traveling around, a big crowd gathers around Jesus and he starts up a story, uh, a story called a parable. And parables are these little comparison stories. You know, you, you know parables, these comparison stories. Life is like a box of chocolates. That's a parable. Uh, dating is like fishing. Um, there's a lot of fish in the sea. The kingdom of God is like a parable. And Jesus tells one of his greatest hits, and I imagine that he told this in, in all these towns and villages on repeat. He probably tweaked the details here and there because that's what preachers do. I mean, I, I changed my introduction just from the first service to this one. So, And, he, and he, tells, he tells a story, and he says, A farmer scattered seed. Some fell in good spots. Some fell in bad spots. Some grew nothing. Some grew a lot. Open your ears and listen, everybody. And that's it. That's the end of the sermon. His sermon, not mine. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for just a second. I don't know if Jesus told some other stories there on that occasion or if that was just one of several stories, but I, I want you to imagine you've walked miles to see Jesus, to hear you know, about his famous wisdom. Maybe if you're sick, maybe I can get up there and I can touch him and maybe he'll heal me or heal a friend. And, and instead, you get this, this weird little story about seeds. And you grew up around farms, if you were there at the time, and you're like, I, I know all this, Jesus, I know how it works. What do you, what do, you do? Do you get mad and leave? You know, demand your money back? Can't believe I traveled all this way just to hear a little story about seeds. Do you stay and, and hope to hear more? Maybe, maybe he's going to elaborate. His disciples do something that seems kind of sensible. Teacher, hey, we got a question. What are you talking about? <laughs> what does that mean? What's the story about Jesus? And Jesus tells them, he answers. He, in fact, he even tells them why he uses these stories, these parables. He says, you all, my, my disciples, you all here in my inner circle, you've been given special insight into how God works and what God's up to. But I use stories with other people. And then to kind of explain why, in part, he quotes this line from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6. And, and, and it sounds like, well, listen to what he says. He says, though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. And it sounds like he is saying, well, I tell them stories because I want to confuse people. But that can't be what it means for a few different reasons. First, that interpretation makes the parable itself pointless. The parable is about to, it, 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 that we're about to read explains why some people get it and some don't. 
And if some people get it, well, then it can't be just to confuse people. Well, second, it contradicts the whole point of Jesus' ministry. He's here to tell people about God. And if you wanted to, you know, have people be in the dark about that and just hide God, why bother showing up at all? Third and last of all, it really misunderstands parables, what these stories are and what they do. Parables are analogy stories. They're analogies. A is like B in some ways, but not in every way. Life is like a box of chocolates in some ways, but not in every way. And parables are analogy stories that invite active listening. They invite you to participate in understanding. They challenge you to puzzle out how life is and is not like a box of chocolates or how hearing the gospel is and is not like a farmer sowing seed. You have to choose to understand more or not. And you can turn to just uh, choose to turn off your thinker and not go any deeper with this. Ah, it's confusing. I don't know. I'm done. And Jesus' point is this, that some people hear me, but they don't really hear me. Which brings us back to the question, why do some people get it and some people don't? And you you got to admire this. The way he answers it is really kind of meta. He, he, he explains why he uses parables by using a parable. He, why do I use stories? Well, let me tell you a little story. And, and we learn not just why some people get it and some don't. We learn a little bit about God. And, and what do we learn about God? Well, we learn about how God grows God's kingdom. God's not into force or big flashy productions. Um, God grows the kingdom through this message, through his word, the gospel. And, and in the story, there's almost kind of like a careless generosity. The farmer's just throwing seeds everywhere. Yeah, throw it over there. What about over there? Yeah, throw it over there too. What about over there too? Some of those spots aren't any good. That's fine. Throw the seed. And, and in this story, Sometimes God is the farmer scattering this word, and Jesus is the farmer as he's traveling around telling people about the kingdom. And I'm the farmer right now as we're talking about the gospel, and you're the farmer when you share about your faith. And, and you kind of stumble along and explain it, or you, you hand them that invite card and say, hey, it, it, would you, would you want to come to church with us on Easter? This is how God grows the kingdom. Through people like us. <laughs> but we also learn why some people get it and some don't. And there are four possible responses. First, some people are sabotaged by spiritual attack. Now, as I see it, that covers a lot of situations. You know, people may resist the gospel because they've been hurt. And, and, and believe me, if somebody's been hurt, whether it's by a, by a Christian or institutional church or, or by somebody that else that they loved and trusted, that's a spiritual attack. Or when we give in to temptation and we kind of just follow our own desires, that's, that, that's spiritual attack. But that snatches away the gospel really ever taking root in us. Some people, he says, lose faith because of suffering. They, they may hear about Jesus and receive this message about God with joy, but, but it's kind of shallow. There's, there's never any, any deep roots that go down. And so when, when the hard times of life come, and they will come, that faith just doesn't have the strength to get through it. A third group, a third group misses the gospel because of success. So you got suffering over here. We, you know, we didn't get enough of, the, of what we need for life. And, and over here, we got too much. 
you know, I've been out this past week uh, trying to get my garden ready for, for spring. And, you know, each year feeling like I learn a little bit. And, you know, one of the lessons I learned one year was you can't give the plants too much water. You can't, they, 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 you can't deprive them and you, and you can't make, give them too much. And we're the same way. If we have too much of the creature comforts of life, it's spiritually disastrous. You know, we, we, we get into this mindset of, of, we go, well, why would I need God? I mean, I, why would I need anybody's help? I mean, look what I've accomplished. I've done okay by myself. And we kind of allude to this, by the way, every week when we pray that prayer of generosity. But some people do get it, and they get what I would call a sticky faith. It, they get it, and it sticks. It, it matures, and it bears fruit in their life. And this, the fruit that we're talking about is, is an inner change um, that, that is, also shows up as an outer change in our behaviors, all consistent with the way of Jesus. And again, all kinds of people have this sticky faith. You can't just say, well, this, this people group, they're going to get it, and th this one won't. Poor people will get it, rich people won't. Rich people will get it, poor people won't. Men will get it, women won't. Women will get it, men will get it. You, you can't do that. In fact, if you go back and read uh, the first four verses of chapter 8, you get sort of a little snippet of this, where, where Luke both highlights the fact that some of Jesus' chief followers were women, and that, by the way, their faith was very sticky because they are going to be there at the cross when all the men have run away. Some of them will be there on Easter morning when all the guys are kind of hiding out. But they're, they're women from diverse strands of life. Some come from nothing. Some come from very high positions of society. So what is it? What is the thing that these people have that helps them to get it? And Jesus tells us the clue. He mentions it twice, verse 12 and verse 15. It's the heart. It's the heart. He says these people have a noble and good heart. What he means is they have an honest openness to Jesus. So, so they, they're open to what, what is Jesus going to tell me? And they're open to obeying it, to following through, to putting it in practice. In fact, he confirms that just a few verses down, verse 21, where he's um, talking about his real family. Jesus says, my real family are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. There, there's an openness that these people have that makes them willing to receive this good news where others don't. And we all know what that's like to be closed off, right? We know people who are closed off from listening to someone else. We know what it feels like when someone is closed off to us. They put up the wall or we put it up to them. You can read the body language or you know that there are certain topics that with that one person, if I bring this up, I know it's instant shutdown. Like you know that, right? I was talking to somebody the other day, and I'm like, oh, I, I, "Look, I let, let's not let's don't talk politics. Like you're here, and I'm here, and let's just let's just not talk about it." And 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 they they brought it up, and we're on the phone. So I just I felt the shift. I felt it. I went to hearing but not listening. Like I'm just gonna go about doing this, washing the dishes or whatever I was doing, and I'm gonna let them talk. <laughs> Until I was like, okay, so anyway, other news. You know what that's like. And you know what that closed offness is. And Jesus is saying, some people, have, for various reasons that we've talked about, have that closed offness, and others have this openness. Which means the thing that they're really listening with is not their ear, but their heart. Because the hearing is not about whether you're registering the sound waves but are you internally digesting it and letting that message do something inside of you? And he says, um, they, they hold it tight for the long haul. They retain it. And when he says they retain it, that word there has this sense of you're, you've got something that you care about and you're protecting it. 
Um, you know, a football player, running back, when they catch that ball and they, they say, Don't tuck it in, tuck it in. You know, they, they've got it right here, and so they're running with it tucked, and that other arm is there to kind of, you know, swat away the defense. Or you could think of a, a mother being protective with her baby. You know, she you hold it just right, support the head, and the other arm's protecting. And can I hold your baby? I'm like, well, I don't know. You know you, do you know how to hold the baby? They're protective. They retain it. So there's a determination, Jesus says, to keep this open and obedient heart. So pause there and ask that question again. Why do some people get it and some don't? And the answer is they have this openness. But what do we do with that? What do we do with that information? Why is he telling us that? I mean, it's good to know. But what does he want us to do with it? Well, again, he's kind of implied it all along, but then in the very next story, he makes it really clear. We've mentioned uh, one of those stories where he talks about his real family, people who hear and do what Jesus says. But then there's, there's another little parable, little story about a light from a lamp. In verse 18, listen to what Jesus says. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. And what did Jesus say back in verse 8? If you've got ears, listen. I know the English says, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. It's because we don't, our English is just not as precise a language as Greek was. When it says let them hear, that was a command. It was, listen, you, listen up, pay attention. What's he say in verse 18? Think hard about how you Listen. And what receives the message? Not your ears, your heart. Do you take this good news, this gospel, this Jesus to heart? Jesus is saying, look, I, I, I'm not telling you this story so that you will obsess over why all the other people around you may get it or not get it. It's good information for you to know, but I'm telling you this story to make sure that, so you can make sure you get it and that you are in a position to get it and to get anything else that I say to you. And the reason is because no matter how much you want it for somebody else, no matter how much you want your kid or your grandkid or your, your neighbor or your coworker, whoever, to receive the gospel, to, to see Jesus the way you do, you do, to know him the way you do, you can't make that choice for them. Do you know the number of people that you control? Just one. Just one. How many hearts do you control? Just one. Just yours. That's the only heart that you've got to control. You can sow seed, you can share the gospel, you can bear witness to your faith, but the thing that will, that will do the most will be the condition of your own heart, your own receptivity to Jesus. Because the only heart that's yours, is yours. So, how's your heart? How's your heart? Is your heart right now, today, open and inviting to Jesus? Not how was it yesterday, five years ago? How is it right now? You know, doctors sometimes order a stress test. Anybody ever had a, a stress test? Anybody? Few people have, yeah. And, and what they want to know is, uh, how does your heart respond whenever it's forced to do something? In other words, it's under stress. There's pressure put on it. Um, and, you know, they put a bunch of, you know, wires on you, often maybe put you on a treadmill. Well, we need a spiritual stress test, a spiritual heart check from time to time. Um, 
And again, Jesus wants to make sure we're not spending all of our time obsessing over other people, but asking, what is the condition of my heart? And again, if you've been with us on this journey through Luke, this is not news. Jesus has been making this point all along. You, you may wonder and think about what she did and what he didn't do, and well, you know, a real Christian would never do that, and maybe all that's true. But the question is, who's examining your life and your heart with that level of scrutiny? Because the only heart that's yours is yours. So how is your heart? You know, when you get on an airplane, you know, one of the things they, 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 they take you through the whole song and dance about safety and everything. And they say, you know, in the event that the cabin is depressurized, you know, the oxygen mask will descend. And if you're traveling with a, a child, what do they want you to do first with that mask? Put your own oxygen mask on first. Which is a way of saying you've got to be in a position to be helpful. If you're unconscious, you can't help anybody. And you've got to be able to get your own heart in the right place if you want to help other people to do that. Is it open and obedient to the Lord? The only heart that's yours is yours. So how is your heart? One of the most dangerous conditions that the Bible talks about is having a hard heart. Old Testament, New Testament, all over. The heart grows stiff, callous, unresponsive. It's bad physically. It's bad spiritually. And, and maybe, maybe for some of us, we can remember a time when our heart was a little more pliable, a little healthier spiritually. We were a little more responsive. We were a little more excited for Jesus. We were ready to do whatever he said. And maybe our heart has grown just a little bit harder. And we want it to be pliable and tender again. Some of you may be new to faith and you may have lots of questions about God and Jesus and the Bible and that's normal and that's good. But one of the questions to ask yourself is this. If my biggest questions about God got answered, would I be open to following Jesus? If my biggest questions could get answered, would I be open? Not guaranteed, but open to following Jesus. And again, James names those three spiritual James. Jesus names those three stresses on our hearts. Spiritual attack. Suffering. Success. When you look at your heart condition, how do you respond in those moments when, when you feel like there's just something or some things picking at you? You're not even sure where is this coming from or it's coming from everywhere all at once. Maybe it's spiritual attack. How do you respond? When you're going through a hard time in life, does it, do you feel like pulling away from God or leaning in a little bit closer? And, and the, maybe the hardest one for those of us who live here in one of the most resource-rich places on planet Earth where we've got so much opportunity, how am I doing when I feel successful? When all my bills are paid and I could go on that vacation I wanted to go on and get the car I wanted to buy. And the TV, it's exactly the number of inches I want. Not only am I watching Netflix, I paid for no commercials. Am I leaning in closer to Jesus in that moment or further away? You get one heart to control and it's yours. So how is your heart? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for these stories that tease our thinking, that, may, that draw us in to be an active part of what you want to do in our lives. 
God, today we pray for an open and obedient heart to Jesus. Some of us, God, are new to this faith thing or maybe not even sure if we are a, a, a believer yet. And God, we pray as an honest searcher for truth, if that's us, that, that we would genuinely be open to the truth even if it leads us to the arms of Jesus. God, for some of us, we, we, we are in a space and a moment right now where our hearts are open, they're pliable, they're excited about Jesus, and we want to tell people, and we want to do stuff in Jesus' name. And God, we pray that you would just help us, like that running back or that, that mother protecting your baby, help us hold on to that. For others of us, maybe life has made us a little jaded, a little cynical. We've been beat up, or, or maybe we've just grown comfortable, but we know our hearts are not quite as open as they used to be, not quite as pliable and soft. God, soften our hearts. Soften our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. And soften our hearts, we pray. And do this in Jesus' name.